I'm excited to be here today. Amen. Hey, uh, let's give it up for all of our dads and wish them a happy Father's Day. Come on, give it up for all the dads in the house today. You know, it's really cool. I just love seeing dads in church, especially on this day. All across the nation, it's a really sad reality, but the statistic proves true in most places. Mother's Day is one of the highest attended day of church, and Father's Day is one of the lowest attended day of church. Already today, though, we're breaking numbers in attendance. Come on, somebody say, yeah. praise God. <laughs> Uh, men, are, I love it. You're, you're leading your family well and coming to the house of God. And I believe you chose a really good Sunday, too. You chose a really good Sunday. We've been in this series that we've just called David, the life of a king. And it, it started out to be a, what I thought was going to be a four-week series, and it's stretched to seven weeks now. We're in part number seven of this series, and God's just been doing some amazing things through this lessons of this life of a man after God's own heart. It is a sad day, but I think it's going to be a climactic day as we end with uh, talking about leaving a legacy. Here, here we've, we've studied David now for seven weeks, you guys. We've looked at his life. We've looked at his successes. We looked at his, his character, but we've also looked at his flaws, haven't we? We've looked at his mistakes, we've looked at his sins, we've looked at some of the setbacks of his, of his life. And in, in this stage of his life that we're going to study today in First Chronicles chapter 28 and 29, he's about 70 years old now. He's in the latter years of his life. But this same man, with all of his successes and failures, with all of his you know, celebratory qualities and his mistakes that he made, this man would be known as the greatest king Israel has ever had. And it wasn't because of his personal achievements. It wasn't because of his character uh, 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 or the flaws that he, that he had. It was actually because of his wholehearted devotion to God. It was because of his passion for God and his passion for people and serving and empowering and loving people. Here's the good news for you today that I hope that you will receive and hear from the message. That you might have messed up in your past, but you can still leave a legacy. Like you might like, yeah, that stuff does not identify you. It doesn't have to carry you with you like the mistake. And so many of you feel that you're disqualified because of your past, because of your mistakes. Maybe some big things, at least in your mind, at least in a few people's minds. And, and you kind of diminish the quality of your life. The expectation that you have of your life is maybe not the expectation God has of your life. It may be that many of us, we're just selling our, ourselves and God short of what he wants to do. It doesn't matter the mistakes that you've made. David wants to teach us today in this latter part of his life that doesn't matter what your past is, you can leave a legacy. This is the final test in this phase of David's life. The final test of his life is raising up the next king of Israel. The king that has big shoes to fill. Like he's going to follow in the footsteps of the greatest king ever. And I think it's so awesome. This is so awesome about God that, that God saw it fit to choose the son bore to him through his relationship and marriage to Bathsheba. That Solomon was actually the son of David and Bathsheba. And I think this is so like God, that he wants to take those embarrassing things that you try to hide. Come on, somebody. He wants to take those mistakes that you would rather not talk about, you would rather not admit. You don't want anybody to know that part of you. But this is the amazing thing about God. He wants to take the darkest part, the weakest part, the most broken part, and he wants to turn it around for his glory. If you let him, God can do a deep, transformative work in your life if you don't keep that stuff in the dark, but you have this posture of David and you're repentant and broken and bring it before him. David's going to teach us how to leave a legacy today, I believe. Psalm chapter 90, verse 12. This is one of the Psalms that's actually attributed to Moses. Moses like wrote this Psalm and David included it in the Psalm. So he kind of, it was written in some other place, but he included it in the Psalms. Look what it says. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Here's what he's saying. We're not going to live forever. We're not, gonna, we're not promised tomorrow. You're not promised another year. You're not promised to be able to see your kids graduate. You're not, promi you're not promised it. I know we want to and I want to, but teach us, God, to number our days. As a pastor, I've seen a lot of lives, what I feel is like cut short. I, I've, I've been to a lot of hospitals, and prayed for a lot of people and their family members in their final moments. 
I've conducted a lot of funerals and heard a lot of stories from the family around those moments. And anytime I do that, which this last several weeks, there's been quite a few funerals that I've done and visits that I've, that I've made. And every time I do, it gets me thinking, I wonder what they'll say about me when it's my turn. I wonder what my kids, what stories they'll tell about me, what my friends will say about me. And I don't know if you've, if you've ever thought that. Some people try to shun away from that and don't even think about that. It actually is a sobering and a wise thought to think. Here's the question I want to pose to you today. What will you leave when you leave? And so look, this is the season of David's life. And maybe you're not here at that place, but I'm, I'm hoping that you'll start thinking differently after today. From, from, from today's message and the wisdom of this phase and season of David's life, that you can start thinking differently. Because David is in a season of his life now that he's, this question is in his mind. What am I leaving? What am I going to leave? It's, it's, I'm, I'm near the end. What am I going to leave when I leave? Because it's about time. So in 1 Chronicles 28, 29, we're going to study these. And in these chapters... Um, David is like gathering all the leaders and all like the mighty people and all like the, the elders of Israel with his son Solomon. He's given his final words and his final actions and, and some of the things that we're going to study. Psalm, uh, First Chronicles chapter 28, verse 9, here's what he says, kind of some of the final words he gives to his son. He says, and Solomon, my son, learn to know the God of your ancestors, what? Intimately. The, the final thing, the, the, the thing that he's thinking about, oh, I'm going to leave soon. It's not, he's not thinking, oh, did I, did I leave him enough money? Oh, did I, did I provide for him enough? Did I, did I, did I, did I, am I going to give the house to him? Who am I going to give this to and that to? That's not even, his, not even in his mind at this moment. At this moment, what he's thinking is, son, you, you cannot rest your faith on daddy's faith. You, you, cannot, you cannot rely on my faith anymore, son, nor can it be, oh, the God of, an, of your ancestors. It can't just be the God of the Bible, the God of Abraham and Jace, Jacob and, and Isaac and, and the God of my grandpa or my father. Like, you have to, Solomon, you got to know God personally and intimately. This is, I'm leaving, son, and you got to know this. This is most important for you. Worship and serve him with your whole heart and a willing mind. We're going to come back to that in just a moment. But he goes on to say, he says, For the Lord sees every heart and knows every plan and thought. If you seek him, you will find him. That's a promise right there. If you seek God with your whole heart, you will find him. But if you forsake him, he'll reject you, Solomon, forever. Let me go back to that previous verse because he says a few things. He actually says three things. These three things are what's most important to David, about what he's going to leave when he leaves. He says, I need you to know God. You got to know God. You got to know him personally. You got to know him intimately. But he also tells him, serve him, serve God with a willing spirit. And that word willing in the Hebrew, which your Old Testament, most of it was written in Hebrew. The Hebrew word is shafetz. And this is what it means. To find pleasure in, to take delight in, to choose, to bend to bow. What he's saying is, look, don't, don't serve God because I'm telling you to. Do it because you want to. Like, choose, willingly serve God because the Lord searches your heart. You don't care about your hands, son. He wants your heart. Amen. Serve God willingly, but he also says serve God with your whole heart. And that word whole in Hebrew there is shalem. Shalem. And the word shalem means uncut are unhewn or uncut stones is what it literally means. Later on in, in, in Solomon's life, God would tell him to build the temple of God. And Solomon would build it, but God gives Solomon the command and use shalem for my temple. Use uncut stones, which represents an uncut whole heart, an unhewn, an, uh, an uncut heart, fully devoted, whole heart devotion to our God. You see, uh, whether you're a king of Israel or a shepherd or, or you're a CEO or an employee that's making an hourly wage of some kind, we all have the same battle of our hearts. Every single one of us. It looks like this. Check it out. Here's the battle of our hearts. It's where God is, but our selfish desires are battling for space. 
and the approval for others. So check this out. The, the degree, what we leave when we leave is largely determined by how much of our heart God has, by how much, how we did with the battle of our selfish desires, pushing out devotion to God, wholehearted, willing devotion to God. How much, how much, how much of that battle did I lose? Or maybe even the approval of others and what others think about me and what others say about me. How much space did I actually give what other people think about me instead of what God thinks about me? What you leave when you leave is gonna be determined by who won this battle. Was it a whole heart devotion to God? Did God have your whole heart? If you wanna leave a legacy today, then you need to give God your whole heart. I want to talk to you today about a legacy. It's one of my favorite words. One of my favorite words is, is legacy. I love that word. I want to look at that word legacy and that concept of leaving the legacy and what a legacy is. Before we continue to study David and talk about this examples and how we can leave a legacy, I want to lay a foundation and really just understand this concept of a legacy life. I define legacy in two parts, really. Here's the first part of legacy, my definition. Legacy is this, what people remember when we're gone. Like, what are people remembering about you and me? What are they going to remember about me when, when I'm gone? Because there's going to be a day when I leave this earth. There's going to be a day when you die. There's going to be a day when someone is having, when your family is having your memorial service. Welcome to Discovery. I know. It's going to be an encouraging word today. I promise you it gets, it gets more encouraging, but I, I, I need you to understand this concept and come to grit, like there's, there's going to be a day. It may even be in this worship center. You may be in a box right here under my feet at this altar or in an urn right here. What, what, are, they gonna, what are people going to remember when your life is done? Psalm 112 verse 6 says this, those who are righteous, and he's not talking about like, that's not like righteous on your own actions. What, what we know through, we know that you're, your righteousness is, is dependent on this, that you made the right choice of choosing Jesus, who he is the one who makes you righteous. Amen? Amen. So it's the ones who say, I want to live right. I want to live my life right. Those are the people who don't just get talked about in a service, who just don't get talked about in one memorial service. Those type of people who say, I want to live my life right in Christ, they will be remembered forever, the Bible says. Okay. And to which sometimes, like we may, you may be thinking like, well, is that really a way to live your life? That people actually talk positive about you when you, when you leave? Is that, isn't that kind of prideful? Well, look, if you're only living that way, maybe it can be. But honestly, this is, this is a good thing. To want to be remembered in a good way, in a righteous way, is a good, just like, just like I want to be a good father. I want to be a good husband. You know why? Because God put something inside of me, a desire to be a responsible man, a desire to be a good father, a desire to be a good husband. God put some things inside of us, you guys. Like there's, there's, there are endorphins and chemicals that God created and put inside of you that when you are making a difference in somebody else's life, when you are being generous, that you actually enjoy and take delight in making a difference in somebody else's life. You know why God did that? <laughs> So that you would do it. Because he didn't want you just to sit there and think about yourself. And live for yourself. And do everything just for yourself. And take care of only yourself. God designed you this way. To desire to leave a legacy. To desire to leave something bigger than you. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 10 says this. God is not unjust. And he will not forget your work. He will not forget the outreaches that you showed up to. He will not forget the shoes that you gave off of your feet to that other person. He will not forget when you prayed for that person when they were hurting. He won't forget when you served in kids' ministry. He won't forget when you left a big, gigantic tip for that server and you just said, God bless you, or put a little act of kindness card with it. God is not going to forget your work and the love you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help him. Like this is, even secular sociologists, they agree that the highest like degree of, of, of living for a human being is what they call transcendence. This isn't even like Bible, okay? We're just talking about now the, so, like worldly sociologists, if you, if you study this, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, 
They say the highest degree of human living that a human can experience joy and the peak of his or her existence is something called transcendence. Literally, when you're living your life beyond your life, when you're leaving a legacy. But a legacy isn't just what people remember. I think the second part of legacy is this. It's actually also what God remembers when we're gone. Because ultimately, it's not, about what, it's not all about what others think about us. It's about what God thinks about us. And why does God put that there? Why does God reward it when we live this way? You know why, you guys? Because we would not do it if he didn't put it. We would not do it otherwise if he didn't reward it and design it within us to want to make a difference. You, every one of us have a, has a gravitational pull towards selfishness. I don't care how, like, you know, awesome you are and how selfless and, and how much of a good Christian that you are, okay, every single one of us at the core is a selfish human being. At the core of who you are as a fallen man and a fallen woman, you're a selfish man and a selfish woman. Jason Hannes, separate from the word of God long enough, Jason Hannes, separate from the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit long enough is a selfish man. I think we, we, we forget. Here's what we forget. What we do for ourselves usually dies with us. But what we do for others lives beyond us. We forget that, that God has created us and wired us this way. David is remembered as the greatest king of Israel's history, not because of his achievements, but because of what people and what God remembered about him when he was gone. It wasn't what he did for himself that he was remembered. It was what he did for God that was remembered. It was what he did for other people that was remembered. In fact, like in the New Testament, Jesus actually counted on us living a life of a legacy when he entrusted to us his disciples to go into all the nations, baptize everybody, go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them what I have told you. Like, he, he, he counted on it that we would be legacy livers and we wouldn't kind of hold on to the good news and hold on to the gifts and hold on to the knowledge and hold on to the wisdom. He counted on you being a conduit of his word. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. Paul, now speaking to Timothy, he said, Take the things you've heard me say in front of many other witnesses and pass them on. Somebody say, pass them on. That's what you're supposed to do. You ain't supposed to let that sit in your lap. You're not supposed to let the message just sit in your lap, the word of God just sit in your lap, the revelation just sit in your lap. It was meant to be passed on to faithful people who are also capable of teaching others. You were never meant to accumulate and to stockpile. You were never meant, whether that is the resources of this world or the wisdom of God or the gifts of his spirit, you weren't meant to hold it, but to pass it. See, you're not just in a race. You're in a relay. Come on, amen, somebody? You're not just running a race. Listen to me, man of God, woman of God. You are in a relay. And this is David now. He's at the end of his life, and he's passing the baton. And every one of you are going to come to a stage of life where you have to pass a baton on. David is at that stage where he's passing the baton, and the baton he's passing is a baton of wholehearted passion for God, service and dedication for God. The greatest investment in your life, listen to me, guys, the greatest investment is not your RIA. It's not your 401k. It's in people. That's the greatest investment. The best investment David made was not into the temple. It was into Solomon. See, people outlast buildings. People outlast companies. People outlast financial resources. What will people say about you at your funeral? I've been to some funerals. It's sad. I've been to some funerals where you could just tell. It's hard for people to find something to say. Where people are just like, man, someone should say something. Should we let's just, let's just say some story about this? It's extremely sad. And then I've been to others where you could not stop people from sharing. There was just a couple of weeks ago, we had this funeral service for, we lost a member here at Discovery Church, and she was served on a, on a team, and she was in groups, and it was so amazing at this service. It was actually conducted because the family attends another church, but these team members and leaders and their groups and the team that they served, they were all at the church, and you could not stop these people coming up and sharing. You know why? 
because she lived her life to impact others. She lived a legacy life. What baton are you passing, you guys? What, what baton are you passing to the next generation? Many of you here today, many of you men and women, you didn't even, your father never even passed you a baton. I know, I picked up my baton off the ground. And it was dirty. And it was bent and broken and cracked. And it was full of addiction and alcoholism and abandonment issues and trust issues. And, and some of you are, are, are here today and, and, and you, you have to pick, like my, some of you know my story. I, I shared a little bit about it last week. My dad left when I was one month old. When I, he, he would come around a little bit. He wasn't the greatest dad at all. He'd, he'd say mean things and be distant. I remember asking my mom one day, why do you make dad leave? Because he would leave. He had another family, and he would just come and show up and leave. Why, do you, why does he have to leave, mom? Why do you make dad, dad leave? And, and it was just my perspective, I guess, that that was what mom, mom was doing that because I heard how mom talked about him behind his back and even to his face, so mom must be the one why, why he's leaving. And my mom told me, Jason, he don't want you. He didn't want to have you. He doesn't want to be your dad. And then she told me the story that when you were one month old, he left. And I tried to keep him. I, I grabbed onto his ankles as he tried to leave the house, and I held on. He dragged me out of the house and through the yard and onto the sidewalk and into his car. And, and so I grew up with this picture of my dad. Walking out, dragging my mom. And, and you may be here today, and, and maybe you did get a baton. Maybe you didn't. Maybe, maybe the baton that you have was, was picked up. Listen to me, man and woman of God. You cannot control the legacy you receive, but you can control the legacy you leave. Here's, here's what I want to tell you. Pick up your baton, man of God, and pass on something better. Hey, hey. I know it's dirty. Pick up that baton and pass on something better. David couldn't control the legacy he received. Like he, he, he was often forgotten and overlooked by his dad, by his earthly father and spiritual fathers. He was overlooked and discounted by them. He couldn't control the legacy he received, but David could control the legacy he lived. David is going to show us today that even if you have a messed up past, you can still leave a legacy. How many of you here want to leave a legacy today? Amen. All right. Here's, here's how. Let's study it together. Number one, if you want to be a, leave a legacy, number one, legacy people have an eternal mindset. Legacy people have an eternal mindset. I want you to write that down and just imagine this with me for just a moment. Imagine you've been just given the news that you have one hour left to live. I know, I know this is like a bummer message. I'm really, I really want, I'm, I promise it's going to get better, but I, I need you to see this. It's not, I need you to come to grips with your legacy, with what you're going to leave when you leave. So let's just go there right now. Imagine that, that you've been given one hour left to live. And, and, and if you do have kids, imagine that, that you call your kids to yourself. Come on in, come on in. They come, they come over and they're all there. All your kids are there. What do you tell them? What are you telling them? What are your final words of wisdom? What's your final advice? What's your party? Do you tell them, go make the money, kid. Hustle, hustle, kid. You know, you know make sure you get a good woman. Uh, make sure, what, what, what do you tell them? What, is, what, is the, what are the final words of wisdom that you are going to give your son? David, and the last words that he gave to his son is recorded in 1 Kings chapter Two, the final words. It says, when David, he knew his death was coming. He's on his deathbed. It's approaching. He gave his charge to his son Solomon. I'm going where everyone on earth must someday go. Time out right there real quick. I did some research on this, and I actually discovered that one out of every one person dies. <laughs> wow. Let that sink in for a moment. That, that statistic, bro. 
okay? <laughs> one out of every one. And here's, here's David's thought process, okay? David is, in his final parting words to his son, what he wants him to have is an eternal mindset. He's not concerned so much about resources and things and, and the, the, the things of this world. What he is concerned is about his heart, his devotion to God, and that he knows, hey, son, I'm going to a place you're going to go to. We're going to see each other again. Everybody goes to this place. Everybody is going to leave this earth. We're going to all someday go, but take courage and be a man. Come on, will you say that out loud with me? One, two, three. Be a man. What great advice a father to give. Be a, how do you be a man? Here's what he says. Look what he says. Observe the requirements of the Lord your God and follow all of his ways. Keep the decrees, the commands, the regulations, the laws in the word of God so that you will be successful in all that you do wherever you go. God is not your vending machine. God is not your vending machine to go. No, 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 no. You, you follow God and he will, if you follow him, he will make you successful. See, legacy people, they see this life through the lens of eternity. And if you want to leave a legacy, you got to learn how to look differently. You got to learn how to see differently because a lot of us are seeing only that which is now. Only that which you can touch, which you can feel, what can satisfy even now. And you need a much bigger, you need a peripheral vision. You need a bigger vision. Legacy people, they see this life through the lens of eternity, kind of like what Jesus said in John chapter 4, verse 35. He says, I tell you, open. Hey, look up here real quick. Hey, look up here, everybody. Check it out. If you want to leave a legacy, you got to discipline your eyes. you got to discipline your eyes. You can't get distracted by the opportunities or the problems. you gotta, you got to keep your eyes focused. Open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest, he says. You see, when you, have your, when you have your life focused on eternity, what are the only, the only things that will last in eternity are people. That's the only thing that's going to show up. Not what you're striving for and sacrificing for. Not, not the things that you're trying to, why you spend so many hours away from your house instead of being with your wife or with your kids is not going to matter. I have never seen a U-Haul following a hearse to the grave. You don't take it with you. Everything, everything gets left behind, okay? This is, this is you need to discipline your, your eyes to see the things that, that are unseen. David wasn't concerned with just leaving resources, but with leaving a legacy. And the field is ripe for a harvest. See, souls for his kingdom, that's what lasts in eternity. And, there, and right now, God is moving in this city and in this nation and in his church that the fields right now are ripe for the harvest of the kingdom of God. Every week we're seeing souls come and come and come like never before. Like we have always seen souls radically in, in a, a movement and momentum of God's spirit has always followed Discovery Church. But right now there is something happening in our city, you guys. Something is stirring. Something powerful is happening. Just last week in our second service alone, we had 95 people commit their life to Jesus. There is, the harvest is ripe. And if you want to leave a legacy, you need to start thinking about the things that last in eternity. You need to start thinking about the harvest. You need to start thinking about souls. You need to start thinking about people instead of things and products and programs. Second Corinthians chapter four, verse 18. He says, so we don't look at the troubles. I'm not going to get distra uh, distracted by the troubles. They're not going to get me down. They're not going to get me focused on now. I know where I'm going. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things that we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see now last forever. It's the things that we cannot see that actually show up in eternity. It's like, like right now, the, what you cannot see is what God is doing right now in an eight-year-old's life in Discovery Kids. Like right now, you can't see that, but God is changing that kid's life right now. What you cannot see is that sophomore who finally opened up and had a life-transforming conversation with their mentor at Discovery Youth Rally Night last night. Like it would, you, you may not, you, like even when you know the numbers, 95 people gave their life to God and maybe some of you actually open your eyes or you serve and you see the waves of hands lift up and people surrendering their life to Jesus. Even that which you can see, you still cannot see the unseen. Like the father wounds that are finally healed in some men's hearts today. Like people who can finally relate to God as a father for the first time ever. That which you cannot see, that is 
what lasts forever. These are eternal things. See, the goal isn't to live here on earth forever, but to leave something that does. That's the goal of a legacy person. I'm not going to focus just on living my life long enough. I want to leave something better. I want to pass along something better. Legacy people have an eternal mindset. Number two, legacy people understand sacrifice. They understand sacrifice. I've come to the conclusion that no one makes a difference without giving up something. It can't happen. Nobody can make a difference without giving up something. This is the law of sacrifice, that those who want to leave a legacy, a life of transcendence, a life that is bigger and beyond you, understand this law of sacrifice. The legacy people understand it. First Chronicles chapter 28. Let's continue reading in there. It's not in your handouts, this part of it. First Chronicles chapter 28, starting at verse 1. I just want you to see kind of the scene and the picture of, of David gathering all these leaders. It's so, just, just look at it with me. I want you to just imagine this. It says, now David assembled at Jerusalem all the officials of Israel, the leaders of the tribes, the commanders of the divisions that served the king. Go ahead. The commanders of thousands and the commanders of hundreds and the overseers of all the property and, and, and livestock belonging to the king and his sons with the officials and look, the mighty men that we've studied, the men of valiant warriors. Like picture that, like this must have been amazing, an amazing assembly. This is like one of the reasons why David was so amazing. It was not only what he did for God, but what he did for other people. Like no other king before him, he was someone who empowered and believed in people unlike Saul before him, who was the king before David, Saul, who was very micromanaging, very dictatorial, like everything had to flow through him and go through him. And, and David is like the exact opposite. He like set up leaders and elders and warriors and mighty men and empowered and delegated and believed in people. And sure, there's a lot of risk with that. There absolutely was. Some of them made some big mistakes, but David knew the law of sacrifice. David knew that if he was going to leave a legacy that was bigger than him, then he couldn't do it all himself. That I got to actually give some of my stuff away. I got to sacrifice some of this responsibility, some of this stuff. and some of, I got to give some of this away if I want to live a life that outlasts me. So it says, then King David rose to his feet and said, listen to me, my brothers and my people. I had intended, check this out, David said, I had in mind, I had intended to build a permanent home for the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and for the footstool of our God. So up to this time in history, they still had the, the tent of meetings or the tabernacle of what it was called, which that is where they, they kind of had the Ark of the Covenant where the priests would make all their sacrifices. It was a literal tent. It was what they used when they traveled from Egypt and they were wandering in the desert there, that whole time. They used this portable tent that they would put up and they'd wander, put it up and make the sacrifices. They still had that. Even at his old age, 70 years old, they didn't have a permanent building. And so, so David was like, you know, had this strong conviction like, man, I got this palace. This beautiful palace. Everyone else has beautiful homes and stuff and God has still got this rinkety tent. The, the same tent we've been using from Egypt all these years, everyone else is... is is look at it and look at look at this shabby old thing. He's like this. So so he's saying I had intended to actually build God a permanent home. So he, he says I even made preparations to build it. Like he drew the 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 blueprints and everything. But check this out. He said, but God said to me, you shall not. You're not going to do that, David. You shall not build a house for my name, because you're a man of war, and you shed blood. And he said to me, your son Solomon is the one who's actually going to build my house. So Solomon comes from the Hebrew word shalom, which means peace. So he said, David, you're a man of war. Solomon is a man of peace. And he's going to be the one that builds my temple. Here's what I want you to kind of come to grips with today. Like, what do you do when you find out the dream that you had for your life is not the dream God had for your life? What do you do when, when, you, when you find out the ambition, the goal that you were striving for was not God's will, goal, or plan for your life? I think a lot of times we, we, we're mistaken to put all of our faith in our answered prayers and the achievement of our dreams. God is bigger than your dreams. What, I think 
you're going to come to this place, possibly, people, you'll come to this place where you just have to accept that you're not going to do that thing. You're never going to do that. You're never going to go there. You're never going to achieve that. You're not going to be around for that. This, the, and so what do, you, what do you do? Well, if you, if you realize that you're in a, in a, not just in a race, but you're in a, leg, you're in a relay, you actually prepare the next generation to go further. And here's, here's what David did. It says the King David, he, he knew, so he turned to the entire assembly and said, my son Solomon, whom God has clearly chosen as the next king of Israel, is still young and inexperienced. <laughs> I can picture Solomon at this point, right? There's all these leaders and mighty men and all these like amazing people that fought with David and leading thousands and thousands of people. And his, he's sitting there, young Solomon, like heart pounding. Like, oh, my God, I'm going to have to lead these, these people. He says, he's still inexperienced, and the work ahead of him is enormous. For the temple he will build is not for mere mortals. It's actually for the Lord God himself. So here's how David responds. And now, because of my devotion for God, he says, because of my devotion for the temple of my God, I am giving, look at this, all. David didn't give some. David said, I'm giving all of my own stuff, all my private treasures, all of my private gold, all the stuff that I had in my house. Like, I'm giving give it all to help the construction and to fulfill this dream. David said, I'm not going to see it in my lifetime, but I'm not living for my lifetime. I'm living for a legacy. Here you go, kid. In, in a season of life where so many people filter through the lens of the ticking clock, of their lifetime, in a season of life where so many other people think about what more can I, oh, I got more time now, I'm retired now, now I paid this off and I got more money, what more can I get? What more can I experience? What more can I do? What more can I enjoy? Here David is not consumed by the clock, but driven by eternity. Legacy people understand sacrifice. Here's what they know. They choose to do less for themselves so that they can do more for others. And if you want to be a legacy person, then you need to make this choice. That in whatever season and stage of your life, you need to make a choice that you are going to do less for yourself. You're not going to live selfishly. You're going to live sacrificially. Legacy people do less for themselves so they can do more for others. Here is David. He's in front of all of Israel leaders and these elders, and he's telling his son, like, take courage. You know, be a man and give your whole heart and service willingly to the devotion of God. And he's given his own resources and all of his own gold. And I got, like, no wonder Solomon, when God asked him, what do you want? I'll give you anything you want. No wonder Solomon asked for wisdom above anything else. Solomon said, I just want wisdom, God, to, in order to lead your people, in order to lead my life. God, I need your wisdom. And Solomon wasn't perfect. Like his father, he wasn't perfect, but he was the wisest person to ever live. And he was the wealthiest. God said, and because you didn't ask for wealth or fame, I'm going to give it to you anyway. See, it's the wisdom of God that brings wealth. And, and when you have the wisdom of God, your wealth doesn't own you. You own it. Oh, come on. Amen, somebody. Are you hearing this today? Matthew 6, 19 and 20. Jesus says this. Don't store up for yourselves treasures on this earth. Hey, you got, if you want to be a legacy lever, if you want to pass on something better, woman of God, man of God, if you want to pass on something better, don't just store it up here where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But he says, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Live eternity. What are the treasures in heaven? Again, souls, kingdom, people where moss and vermin don't destroy and where thieves don't break in and steal. See, legacy people understand sacrifice, and David modeled that. You know, success is often determined by what we're willing to give up, not just by what, you're, by what you achieve. Success is more than just what you're, what you're achieving. Success oftentimes is determined by what you're willing to give up. And if you want to leave a legacy, you have to understand the principle of sacrifice. Legacy people have an eternal mindset. Number three, legacy people, they got a sense of urgency. Legacy people sense it, the urgent of the time. So let me say it to you this way. If you want to leave a legacy, if you're in this room and you want to leave a legacy, which I believe you do, I think it's all of you. I believe every one of you want to leave a legacy because God put that in you. God put it inside of you to want to leave a legacy. If that's you and you want that, here's my encouragement to you. Do it today. Like start today. Encourage somebody today. Serve somebody today. Make a difference in somebody else's life today. Teach us, God, to number our days. 
Give us a heart of wisdom that I'm not promised tomorrow. That I don't have to wait till that day. I need to do it today. I got to make the choice now. First Chronicles chapter 28, verse 20 continues. David continues, and he tells his son, be strong and courageous. And I love this. And these three words, let's say it out loud. One, two, three, and get to work. Say it again. One, two, three, get to work. That's what he tells him. Get to work. Don't be frightened or dismayed. Don't be discouraged by the calling of God on your life. Just get to work. I know it's scary, man of God, to pick up that baton. I know it's dirty. I know you got to wipe off the addiction that's following your house. I know you got to wipe off the poverty that you were handed down. I know you got to deal with the trust issues, with the abandonment issues, but pick up your baton and get to work. Be strong. Be courageous. Be a man. Pick up that baton. I don't care how dirty it is. I don't care if it wasn't passed to you right where it is today. Pick up your baton and get to work. 2 Timothy chapter 4 says this. I urge you, Timothy, as we live in the sight of God and of Christ Jesus, who's coming in power, he's actually going to come and judge the living and the dead to preach the word, he says, of God. Never lose your sense of of urgency. Be ready, he says, in season and out of season. Stop living for someday and start living today. A lot of people have that someday, oh, someday, someday I'll kind of go all in with God. Someday I'll get it right. Someday I'll stop doing that. Someday I'll stop fooling around. Someday I'll stop living for someday and get to work today. Today, today, today. Legacy people have a sense of urgency. Legacy is not some someday thing. It's an accumulation of everyday little things. See, legacy people, they make the most of every day. Today, I'm leaving my legacy. Today, I'm writing it. Today, today. Ephesians chapter 5, I love this verse. He says, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because these days are evil. These days are are short, he says. Legacy people, they live with that sense that I got to make the most of every opportunity. I'm not promised it. Teach me to number my days, God. Teach me to understand what I'm holding is bigger than me. Teach me to understand, God, that, that, that I don't get to choose the legacy I receive, but I do get to choose the legacy I leave. God, help me. Help me. I got a sense of urgency. There was this, this man years ago, a long time ago, a man named Alfred. He actually woke up one morning, he started reading the newspaper, and he read the obituary pretty habitually. He'd read the obituary columns. And, and one day when he woke up and he was reading his obituary, having his coffee like normal, he reads his own obituary. And, and it was a mistake. His, his brother was the one who actually died just two days prior. And, and they got the name wrong and they even wrote it about him. And they, they said, so it's all about him. And he's reading his own obituary. And they even labeled him and named him for what he was known for at the time. And so they said, Alfred Noble, merchant of death. He was the inventor of the dynamite. And in that time in history, the dynamite had killed more people than anything in that time of their history because of accidents and things like that that were happening. And so he was, he was the merchant of death. And later on that day, his attorney called him and said, this is libel. This is like, they should not, like we should sue the newspaper. How dare they talk about, like you're living and they're writing this about you and calling you this, like, like we should sue. And he told his lawyer, no, we're not going to. We're not, I'm not going to sue because they're right. What I'm going to do is change my legacy. And so he, he was already old. He didn't know he only had 10 more years left to live, but he would dedicate the next 10 years of his life in rewriting his legacy. And so he was known as a merchant of death. He said, I don't wanna be known as a merchant of death. I wanna be known as someone who advanced peace. And so he said, you know, I'm gonna, he made a lot of money, so he was reserved a lot of money every year, store a lot of money aside so that he'd be able to give gifts and prizes to, to people who promoted peace around the world. And he said, you know what, Ann, I'm gonna change my legacy. I'm gonna put my name on this. And he called it the Nobel Peace Prize. And to this day, after his death, the cause caught on, and people still to this day give and give and give, and still to this day, every year, a prize is given in Nobel, Alfred Nobel's name. He rewrote his legacy, and, and after he passed away, he actually had hemmed on his gravestone this. Every man, every woman, every grandparent, every man 
ought to have the chance to correct his obituary in midstream and write a new one. Hey, man of God, woman of God, write a new one. Write a new one. Write a new one. Write a new one. Pick up your baton and write a new one. Like you, wherever you're at today, your, your legacy doesn't happen. It doesn't start when you die. It starts today. It starts today. Maybe you're known as, for a lot of other things, maybe you're known as a gossip, maybe you're known as a cheat, maybe you're known as for your pride, maybe you're known for your anger. I don't know what you're known for today, but you can pick up your baton and you can start writing a new one today. Let me, let me, Acts chapter 13, 36, it's, I think the fitting way to close our study of David over these last almost two months, these seven weeks, is to close with this final thought of David. The summation of David's life is the summation of a life well lived. It's one that I would love to have said about me. It's one I want to say about you. Here's, now when David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep. That's the highest living right there, to, to serve God's purpose. In your own, no other generation can do that. No other generation can serve the purposes of God but this generation, but you, but me. So here's what I want you to do. Just put a blank in David's name right there. Put your name, man of God, woman of God. Put your name there, mistakes, brokenness, issues, and all. Now when Jason had served God's purposes in his own generation, he fell asleep. You can write a new legacy. I have uh, actually some, some gifts for the fathers today. They're going to bring them out. Here's, here's what I, they're batons. You're actually going to get a baton today. All the, all the dads and all the men Here's what I want to do before, I'm going to invite you up in just a moment, but here's, here's my encouragement to you, that if you're here today and you want to pick up the baton and you want to leave a legacy, you want to live your life different today, you want to, you want to leave a, a transcendent life, then this baton is for you. And here's what I want to say, pick up the baton, be a man, and get to work. Hey, it might, I, it, it's going to be work. It's going to be work to dust off this stuff, to change your legacy, to rewrite that thing. I get it, but pick it up. Today, you start rewriting your legacy. If you're a father in this house today, if you're a man in this house today, I'd love for you to come up. Just get out of your seat right now. Will you come and pick up one of these and just come on up. And if you're here today, you say, I want to, re I want to rewrite my legacy. I want, to, I want to be known. I want God to remember me. I want people to speak about me. I, I want to be known. I want, I want to live with an eternal mindset today. As you pick up that baton, here's what you're saying. I want to live with an eternal mindset. I don't want to live temporally. I don't want to live just for the things of this world. I don't want to get distracted by opportunities, by the problems of this world. I'm going to live for eternity. I'm going to make a difference in people's lives. I'm not going to make my life about things. I'm not going to accumulate things and stockpile things. I'm not going to live a selfish life. I'm going to live a life that impacts others. I'm going to be a man. I'm picking up my baton. I'm taking courage today. I'm being a man, and I'm going to get to work. What you're saying is you're going to leave a legacy life by understanding sacrifice, that you're going to live a sacrificial life. That's what you're doing. You're not going to, you're not going to store it up for yourself. The goal isn't to, like, have more yourself to live more for yourself, it's to give more to others. What you're saying is I'm gonna live with a sense of urgency, that we're not promised today, you're not promised tomorrow, you're not promised next year. What you're saying by living a legacy life that today you're gonna start rewriting. Today, with this baton in your hand, you're gonna start rewriting. You don't get to choose the legacy that you receive. You do get to choose the legacy you leave. If some of you here today, maybe you're not even a father or your father may not even be here today. And maybe you're picking up the baton off the ground like me. And I know it's hard work. But I issue this charge to you today that you can be a man of God. That you can pick up your baton. Dirty, cracked, messed up understand that it's got issues. I understand that stuff got passed down, but you can pick it up right there and start writing a new one. You could be a man. You could get to work today. 
and leave a legacy. Can I pray for you? Can every head bowed and eye closed today. I'd love to just pray for you. Can I start with those of you today that, that you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? That God is not the one who's writing the story. Up to this point, maybe the pen has been in your hand and you're writing it yourself. You're your own God and your own Lord. For all intents and purposes, you're the ruler of your own life. And today you recognize that you can't do it. You weren't meant to do it. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, that you shall be saved. You get a fresh start today. God will start to change some of those things in your past, in your heart. You can, he'll start to rewrite some things for you to leave a legacy today if you give your life to Jesus. For some of you, it may be the first time to make that decision to surrender the control of your life. For those, others of you, you just need to do it again today. So here's what I want to do. With every head bowed and eye closed, I, I'm going to count to three in just a moment. And if that's you, I'm not going to have you come up to the front or single y'all, but if you're ready to surrender, go all in with God and let him start being Lord and writing your life and leaving a legacy. And I, on the count of three, I just want you to lift your hand and lift it real high for me. Come on, if you're ready. One, two, three. Come on, be bold right now. Lift that up, lift it up, lift it up high. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Yes, leave it up for me. Leave it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Amen. Amen. All over this place. Come on, leave it up. Leave it up. Lift it high. Lift it high. Be bold. Right there. Here I am, God. Here I am, God. I need you. I need you. I need you. I can't do it, and I don't want to do it anymore without you. All over this place. Thank you, Jesus. Go ahead, put your hand down. Will you whisper something like this? I want you to use your words. Use your voice. Jesus, forgive me of my sins my past and my mistakes. Today, I come to you with it all, and I don't want to lead my life anymore. I surrender the control of my life to you. I give up. Today, I declare, Jesus, you are my Lord, my Savior, my God. Come live inside of me and make me brand new. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Help me to live for you from this day forward you're here today and you want to live a legacy life, man, woman, child, doesn't matter. I want you to just lift up your hand right now. You want to leave a legacy. You want to leave a legacy. Lift up your baton. Lift up your hand. Lift it up really high. Let me just pray over you right now. Lift that up. Lift that up. God, I thank you for today, a defining moment that we didn't get to choose what was passed down to us, whether by genes, whether through the emotions, whether through the attitudes, whether through what was done to us, spoken to us. We don't get to choose those things. You don't get to choose the legacy that we receive, but we do get to choose the legacy we leave. And today, we're making a choice to leave something better, to write something different. We're picking up the baton right now. We're aware of eternity. We're aware of the timing. We're aware, and the time is now. It is urgent. So God, help me write a new one, write a new one, write a new one, that today I'm writing a new legacy, and I'm passing on something better in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Come on, give God some praise if you receive that today, church, amen. Amen.